Hi, I'm Erica graham Gearing, and I'm the author of Princely Power in Late Medieval France, Jeanne de Pontievre and the War for Brittany, which was published by Cambridge University Press in April of 2020. The big question I had going into this research was, what is princely power? Turns out the answer is rather complicated. Basically, I'm looking at the level of aristocratic power just below that of the king. During the Hundred Years' War, the Kingdom of France contained a number of powerful, semi-independent duchies and counties. And the usual way historians have understood how these principalities worked was to see how much like a king the duke or count managed to become. With Jeanne de Pontievre, I was interested in a different side to that story. Jeanne was Duchess of Brittany in the middle of the 14th century, but her claim to inherit the ducal title was challenged by her uncle, leading to more than 20 years of civil war. Although Jeanne ultimately lost that fight, and as we know, the losers don't write the history books, her contested career as Duchess is a great opportunity to rethink the expectations surrounding princely power. In my research, I used Jeanne's surviving charters, letters, and legal documents. And I look at both her actions as Duchess and how she framed and justified her power in these records, so what kind of image she created for herself as a ruler. The book breaks this down thematically by how Jeanne handled different aspects of government, such as managing her lands and money, maintaining political and administrative relationships, and, of course, waging war and legitimizing her position as Duchess. What I found across all of these areas was that, rather than trying to stick to a single model, successful rule depended more on being able to move between different norms, playing them off against each other to best advantage. In particular, if we come back to the idea of a king, that means, in broad strokes, a man exercising exclusive sovereign authority. Jeanne was, well, not those things. She was a noble rather than royal, so she's not at the top of the pile. She was, of course, a woman, and she shared power with her husband Charles, at least until his death at the end of the war. These three factors social hierarchies, gender, and co-rule, were influential in shaping Jeanne's authority. But instead of just determining what she could and couldn't do, they played out in different ways across Jeanne's career. This was because there were multiple, even conflicting expectations attached to each factor on its own, and of course in practice they often overlapped. Just as a very basic example, at this time, women had just been barred from inheriting the French throne. But as a noblewoman rather than a queen, the expectation was very much that Jeanne could inherit, so it was to her advantage to be non-royal for this purpose. Moreover, Jeanne could actively use different norms as political tools to influence events as they unfolded. One trick she liked was to invoke her husband's authority, saying she couldn't make decisions without him. Except she actually did that all the time. It just looks like she used him as an excuse when she didn't want to do something. So Jeanne's career sheds new light on how contextualized and contingent the social expectations were surrounding rank, gender, and collaborative rulership. Taken together, this gives us a new picture of princely authority in the Middle Ages. Being a prince wasn't always easy, but it was easier if you embraced a certain degree of flexibility in how you went about it. I think this book will be of interest to historians well beyond the confines of medieval France. Because even this single lived experience of power branched out in so many directions, Jeanne's case helps us reflect on wider dynamics of power in pre-modern society, from the act of intercession or the structures of aristocratic families to ideas of lordship and the political community. It also raises questions about how we tackle the study of power itself, highlighting the range of roles it encompassed and the need for a broad approach to understanding the social bases on which it rested. I'm extremely honored that my book has been included on this shortlist, and would like to thank the Royal Historical Society for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about it today.